the chorus of that song, part of that is absolute truth all the time. He leadeth me, he leadeth me by his own hand, he leadeth me. The, the next part is sometimes true and sometimes it's not. It's faithful follower I would be. So when we go through this, this part of Hebrews that we're working our way through, and talk about striving and persevering, that, that's what it's talk, talking about. As we were singing that, I was thinking of, of one day this past week when, when uh, uh, Kathy and I were watching our grandson, and he loves to go up the street, go across to the farm that's across uh, Banning Road from where we live. He loves to just go over there and look around. And he's, he's not two yet, and he wants to just go on his own. Uh, up the street and across the road. And of course, I don't let him do that. <laughs> you know, I, I, I take him, I, lead, I carry him, or I maybe hold his hand whether he wants to hold mine or not. And um, it's important that we strive to be faithful followers of God because he's always leading and safety in the right direction. Lord God, we thank you for leading us. May we indeed be faithful followers. This morning, May we faithfully follow you by hearing your word, by reading it for ourselves, by hearing it preached, by desiring to do what it says. So Lord, we ask that the things that we should know that we don't, we ask that you would teach us the things that we need to have that we don't that you would give us, and the things that we have not yet become but should be, that for Jesus' sake he would make us. Amen. So we return to our study in the book of Hebrews. We're in the fourth chapter. Again, we'll be looking at verses 11 through 13. Last week we concluded with verse 11, but it's an important part of the context for for these verses, so we're going to continue with that. Um, God knows. God knows. People use that phrase a lot, or something like that, and often in response to a question that no one knows the answer to, right? And God only knows, someone will say. Well, when they say that, whether they're thinking about it or not, they're saying something that's absolutely true. God does know. And, and when I was reading through this passage that we're going to study this morning, and every time I read this, it always reminds me of the third chapter of the book of Genesis. The place where right after Adam and Eve were in the garden, and, and the serpent came, Satan came in the form of the serpent and, and tempted them, and they took of the fruit that God had told them not to take of, and they sinned realized what a horrible thing they had done and they, they attempted to cover up, right? They wanted to cover it up. They made a fig leaf loincloth, it says. In every way, it was a poor attempt to cover what they had done. And don't cover ups just usually tend to wind up badly. And then this. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man and said to him, where are you? Now this was a rhetorical question. God knew where they were. He was giving them a chance to respond, to come out and, and, and to, to, to say clearly what had been done. And Adam sort of starts to do that, but it doesn't go well. He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And God replies, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Again, a rhetorical question. God already knew the answer. How did Adam respond? Yes, I did. No, that's not what he says. He says, that woman that you gave me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is it that you have done? And she said, That serpent deceived me, and I ate. So I, I found this interesting, really kind of looking at, at that this, this week. What happened after that first sin? Well, there was shame. Like, right after they had done it, they were ashamed. They realized they had done something wrong. They had sinned against God. 
and, and for those of us who, who believe in God, when we sin, that is our response, right? There, there is a response, a, a rightful response of, of shame. In the presence of a holy God, is that those who committed sin, there is shame. Well, then for Adam and Eve, the next thing that came were excuses. The woman you gave me, the serpent, all attempts to justify a decision that they freely made on their own. A poor decision, and one freely made. But between the shame and the excuses come, comes this thing where they, they tried to hide. They, they want to hide, it must be because they thought they could hide. We don't really know what their understanding of God was at that point. But I just had to ask, did they not realize the extent of God's presence? Did they not realize the extent of God's knowledge? Did they not realize the extent of God's vision? They thought less of God than they should have. And again, I don't know how fully they understood who God was before the sin, but, but one thing sin does is to lower your understanding of the omnipresence and omniscience of God. So, so, so they hid. And, and I, again, I wonder if they're, they're thinking they could hide from God, thinking that he was less than they thought was, was brought on by this sin. And even if they didn't think they could stay hidden from God, if they thought they could just do it for a moment out of reaction uh, uh, to the sin that they had just committed, if they could stay out of his sight for a while, if they have a child do something wrong and run to their room and hide as if you don't know where their bedroom is. Well, we can wonder these things and and, and I want to be cautious about wondering about things of Scripture. I wonder a lot when I read the Bible, but my wondering is not inspired by the Holy Spirit as Scripture is. So let's stick to what we do know. Sin. Sin caused them to run and hide from God. We know that. That's clear in Scripture. Reaction to sin in a person is to cause them to try and hide from God. And we're going to see in today's passage that God still sees our sin. He sees it clearly. Just the way God could see the side of the tree that Adam wasn't on, and he could see the side of the tree that Adam was on. And God's vision extends, of course, beyond our sin. We know the, the baby bird can't fall from the nest, right, without God knowing about it. But this passage is a specific warning that, that whatever you're doing, whatever you're thinking, the state of your heart, God knows it. So if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, turn to Hebrews chapter 4. And again, we're going to pick up at verse 11. Coming from the place where we've been a number of different times, the writer of Hebrews has compared the people of his day to the, to the people that came out of the Exodus, right, when the, when the Israelites were rescued and how they refused to go in the promised land, how they were obedient, and they were, they, God did not allow them to enter what he called his rest. So then picking up at verse 11, let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the, the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him whom we must give account. So in verse 11, the, the, the preacher here is calling us to not be like the faithless generation that refused to enter the promised land, refused to enter into God's rest. We want to enter into God's rest. And he's telling us here that we should want to, we should persevere in that, and not just for ourselves, but with others. That's an important component of this that, that really has uh, struck me these last few weeks as we've been looking at this. It's, it's part of that, you, you, look at you, check, make sure that, that you are where you should be, and then when you know that you are, begin to look around you, even inside the church. We know there's evangelism to be done outside, but among our, our 
Brothers and sisters, the, the, the point here is that when they came out of Egypt and they went right up to the door of the promised land, God's chosen people rescued, brought through the Red Sea, all that right to the, they were right there. And only two out of the entire generation believed that they could ever. There were only two faithful out of that whole entire group, that whole generation of the Hebrew nation that came out of Egypt. And so they died in the desert and the next generation was allowed to enter. So he's telling the, 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 the Jews here in this day to be cautious. They have left their home, right? They're living in a, in a foreign land. They're not being treated well by other Jews who don't follow Jesus. They're not being treated well by the Gentiles. They can't do business. They can't trade. They, they, they can't get hired to work. Life is hard. He's telling them to keep their eye on Jesus. Keep looking at Jesus. Because some of you are close, but you're not entering in. And I think the, the warning is, is true for the church still today. He's calling us to look for that day, that day when we will enter God's rest, that eventual day that will cross into glory, that day when we go to heaven and, and, and strive for that. Kent Hughes says he urges the hearers to expend all of the reserves of spiritual energy to persevere in faith, and to help one another endure. So last week, we, we ended with this verse, and we said there are five things we think that help us to persevere, to help us to strive. One is, if you're not a Christian, is to come to Jesus, right? To start there. But then for believers to continue to come to Jesus, for help, to come to church, to come to his word, and to come to the throne in prayer. <laughs> So then we see that setting us up for verse 12, that word for, for the living of, for the word of God is living and active. And that little three letter word for is very important because while this verse is perhaps one of the most well-known, if you as a kid did Bible memorization, this was probably on the list somewhere. This is pointing to the, the, the activeness of God's word discerning our sin or not because that's what verse 11 tells us therefore to strive to enter so that no one may fall by some sort of disobedience for the word of God is living and active in other words God knows the difference the word of God is living and active and as often happens I, I, I pause somewhere and think we need to think about this a little more we need to think about the phrase, the word of God. What exactly does the writer of Hebrews mean by the word of God? The phrase is all over the Bible, especially in the New Testament. And, and we all have to look at the context because it means two things that are very closely connected, connected but slightly different. And actually in the Greek, there's two different words. There's a the word logos or logos, L-O-G-O-S. And there's the word rima, R-H-E-M-A. John 1 is logos. In the beginning was the word, logos. And the word was with God, and the word was God. And that word, logos, it literally means an expression of thought, but it's used there in John 1 as a title for Jesus. We see it in Revelation 19 when he, he sees the rider on the white horse who's robed is, is dipped in blood and the name by which he is called is the word of God the word of God is often used as a title for Jesus and the word logos is used when it is used as a title for Jesus though sometimes logos is used in other ways meaning the written or spoken word of God but most often we see the other word rima r-h-e-m-a it typically is used for the written and spoken word of God. So when we see Jesus in the wilderness being tempted by Satan, and Satan offers him all this stuff and finally says, I know you're hungry, it's been 40 days. Say the word and we can turn these stones into bread for you to eat. And what does Jesus say? Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word, Rima, R-A-G-M-A, word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Here in Hebrews 4, verse 12, 
logos or logos is used. The word of God, living and active. <laughs> and it's pretty clear that at least in part that it's referring to the written word of God because we have all through here these, these quotes from Psalm 95, right? All through uh, uh, parts of two and three, and we'll see it again in, in, um, in chapter five, and we see it in chapter four. All, all this is quoting what we would call the Old Testament for the word of God. And so in, in part, that is what it is. So when the Bible uses, when the Holy Spirit inspired these, this phrase to be used, the word of God, you think he was trying to confuse us? Can they mean the same thing? Well, I think what's important for us to remember is that while they are not exactly the same thing, the written spoken word of God is different than Jesus, son of God, son of man, but they are really, really closely woven together. Jesus showed this bonding in, in John 5. He said, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me, Jesus says. And we talk about this all the time, that everything in the Old Testament is, is, is like a, a, a lighthouse or, or a, a sign, a, a signpost, a marker pointing to Jesus. Hebrews 1, that God has spoken to us by his Son. So I think the main thing to remember, even though there are some differences here, when we hear the word of God, remember this. When Jesus speaks, God is speaking. When the Bible speaks, God is speaking. So I think what the author of Hebrews is telling us here about the word of God is that we are receiving what God would have us receive. It's coming from God. It's living. Christ is risen. Christ is alive. These words that were inspired by the Holy Spirit that, that went through the hearts and minds of these men that, that wrote it down on, on paper, they were inspired by God, uh, by the Holy Spirit of God then, and they are living now. They are alive for us now. They are active Jesus is still active. He's not walking in the world in the flesh now, but he is active and alive. Jesus' ministry continues. Jesus is our mediator. He is still our great high priest. And these words written in scripture are active for the believer. So they're living and active and then sharper than any two-edged sword. Two-edged swords were used in battle. Sharp as razors, they were very effective. The, the benefit of a two-edged sword is a, a sword that just has a, a, a sharp on, a, just sharp on one side and a sort of blunt on the other, can only be swung one direction effectively and then has to be turned around, moved, manipulated in another direction uh, in order for the, the one bearing the sword to be successful in battle. A two-edged sword, whichever way it's being swung, it cuts. It's effective. There's no blunt side to it. Whichever way God is wielding, it's effective. The word of God is effective. He goes on to say that it pierces to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints, and marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. There's been, uh, there have been some, some commentators that have tried to really make a point here that this is talking about the difference between soul and spirit. And while that's a discussion to have, that's not the point of this verse here. The point of this verse is saying that God comes, cuts to the quick. God knows everything about us. This isn't an anatomical discussion. God knows us physically better than any doctor or physical therapist or anatomy specialist of any sort. God actually is the one that decided what we would be like, created us, knit us, each of us, each one of us, knit us together in our mother's wombs. He knows what we're like. The point here is the thoughts 
and intentions. Discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. God knows what we're thinking, what we're intending to do, what's in our minds, what's in our hearts. So when we read back in Ephesians 6 about the armor of God and the, the helmet and the shoes and the breastplate and the belt and all that, and when it comes to the sword of the Spirit, we need to know that not only is it pointed at enemy, it's pointed at us. And for our good and for our blessing, it, it, it's, it's God looking at us, seeing us, and knowing us. God knows everything about everyone. He knows everything about everything. John, 1 John 3 says, God knows everything very plainly. He knows everything that's happened in the past, everything that will happen in the future, everything that's happening now. We, we pull up our phones or pull up the internet or turn on the TV and find little pieces of information going on around and many of those probably misinformation. God knows simultaneously everything that is happening everywhere all the time and understands it. He comprehends it. And each person involved in each one of those things, he knows the, their thoughts and the intentions of their hearts as well. So this is very personal for each one of us. It's also global for every person. First Kings chapter eight says, you, only you, know the hearts of all the children of mankind. And verse 13, no creature is hidden from his sight, all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So like Adam and Eve trying to hide and failing, no one can hide. No creature is <laughs> hidden from the sight of God. So even though they had their little fig leaf construction thing going on, they were still naked in the eyes of God. And not just physically. In their entirety, they were bare before him. And this is the same for every creature, every single human being, and every event, and every plant that's growing, and every fish that's swimming, and every bird that's flying, and every ant that's crawling in and out of a hole in the ground, God knows all of it. So, like when Google first came along, we were all really impressed by Google. And for an invention of a human being, it's actually pretty cool, but it is absolutely nothing compared to the mind of God. And it's important for us to remember this because the day is coming when we'll give an account to God. When God approached Adam in the garden, he already knew what Adam had done. When he approached Eve in the garden, he already knew what Eve had done. God knows. God knows everything. So there's three things I'd like for us to consider taking from this passage that might help us to, to process it and also just help us in our Christian life. Number one is this. God's word is sharp, and that's good. God's word is sharp, and that's good. Number two, God knows everything. And we need to tell him stuff. God knows everything, and we need to tell him stuff. Number three, you can't hide, and you don't want to. Not really. Number one, God's word is sharp, and that's good. I don't know if you've ever cut up firewood, whether it's with an ax or a handsaw or a chainsaw, if you've done it for any length of time, and a blade of any of those starts to go dull, you know it. You know it by chainsaws harder to push or when the, when the ax starts bouncing back a little bit, you know it. Have you ever tried to cut a tomato that was a little soft with a butter knife? Right? You end up with a, with a squishy mess. We know that it's good for a blade to be sharp. When God is going to work on us, some of it may be painful, some of it may be difficult. It may be like having surgery. And in surgery, don't we want the surgeon's scalpel to be sharp? We want the surgeon to go in, cut away the tumor, leave the healthy issue untouched and unscathed. And so 
as God works on us as a Christian, it's good that his word is sharp. Even if it's painful, it's accomplishing exactly, precisely the right thing. So I was, in reading this, I was thinking of Peter. I was thinking of, of Jesus going to Peter, Jesus' word being the word of God, right? Jesus speaking to Peter and how sharp and painful it is for Jesus to say, you're going to deny me. And Peter, no. Not, not me, never. Everyone else might, not me. And Jesus, using very sharp words, said, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. I think that had to hurt. But in inflicting that pain, Jesus was performing a necessary surgical procedure on Peter. For whatever it was, whether it was pride or stubbornness or, or, or whatever it was, Peter had an issue that was keeping him from committing fully to Christ. There was something in the way, and Jesus began removing that. Then after the resurrection, we'll, we'll see that the healing began, but it was still a little sharp. It was still a little painful when, when Jesus sits down with Peter and says, Peter, do you love me? We've talked about this before, the different words for love. And he said, do you agape me? Meaning, do you love me with all there is? Do you love me with the love of God? And, and Peter responds, I love you. It says in English, but what we know he really said was, I phileo you. I, I love you like a brother. And Jesus says again, do you love me with all that you are? With your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And, and Peter says, well, I, I love you like a brother. So the third time Jesus says, Peter, do you... You love me like a brother. Yes, I do. And that was painful for Peter. The people talk about Jesus restoring Peter there. I think that was still painful for Peter. But man, when we get to the second chapter of the book of Acts, Peter has recovered from that surgery. Peter has had that whatever it was wrong with him removed. As he stands in, in, in the face of the people he was afraid of when he denied Christ, the people who crucified Christ, and he points his finger at them and says, You killed the Son of God. Peter had been healed by the great physician, but it took a sharp word of God to create something new, to take away something bad, and, and, and to be healed by that great physician. God's word is sharp, but it is good. Number two, God knows everything, and we need to tell him stuff. And that sounds like a conflict. If God knows everything, why do we have to tell him things? If you've raised a child, you know the answer to this. You're out in the yard, or you're in the kitchen doing something, you hear a crash. Little Eddie's been throwing the ball in the house. You've told him not to throw the ball in the house. He threw the ball in the house, knocked the lamp over and broke it. You come in, what he's, what, where is he? He's hiding he's behind the sofa. He went into his room. That sweet little child, sin nature comes through. And he lies to you. And those lies are like the trees in the garden he's trying to hide behind. And then, perhaps, excuses come out. Well, it was because of this or because of that. And, and what's the problem there? Like, you know... He did it. The ball's there, right? The, the lamp's there. It's broken into. You know what happened. You're not seeking knowledge. You're giving the child an opportunity to confess because through confession, confession opens the door for forgiveness to be received. Now, as human parents, we sometimes mess up that forgiveness part, but God never does. We confess. I don't know where the, where the phrase confession is good for the soul actually originates from, but the thought certainly comes straight from the Bible. That's why we have a prayer of confession at the beginning of every worship service. Because we're going to come before the Lord, we're going to sing to Him. We want Him to hear our worship. We want that, that to be our worship to be a sweet aroma that rises to Him. None of that ever happens for one of us as an individual, if we're withholding some sort of sin that's unconfessed. It's not because God can't hear us. It's not because God doesn't know what we've done. It's not confession like the guy showing up at the police station saying, yeah, I did. No, God already knows. But a beautiful, beautiful verse, one of the most beautiful verses in all Scripture, 1 John 1, 9. If 
we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive our sins. Confession opens the door to receive forgiveness. Now we know that our sins are forgiven, right? We know that once we become Christians, every sin we've committed in the past or will commit in the future is forgiven into eternity, right? We can't, we can't break that off and get kicked back into hell. But what does happen, just like little Eddie doesn't, is not because he broke the lamp, isn't kicked out of the family, right? But until he comes and confesses, there's always going to be a difficulty. There's always going to be a rub between, between the little boy and mom and dad, right? There's always going to be something withholding until he, he breaks, his heart breaks and he just says what's happened. Well, we come out of harmony with God when we're withholding our confession. We're not giving God new knowledge. The confession isn't for God to find out what we've done. The confession is to open ourselves to, to be restored in harmony with him. To receive from him. It is such good news that we can approach God. We don't have to you know, slaughter a bull or something or a ram to do that. Jesus has already done that work. And Jesus stands at the right hand of the throne of God, mediating for us when we come and confess. God knows everything you need to tell him. Number three, you can't hide and you don't want to. We have some familiarity. I mentioned it earlier with the verse that says, a, a sparrow, not even a sparrow, falls to the ground without God knowing it. And I, that's, 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 a, that's a lovely thought. You know, out somewhere, a little bird falls to that God knows what's happening. But Jesus did not present that sentence in a sweet and lovely, poetic sort of manner. Jesus is in the gospel trying to firm up the backbones of his followers. He tells them not to be afraid of their mortal enemies. All they can do is kill them. He makes a point that that kind of death, the death in the body for the Christian, is, is not that big a deal in the long run. He says this, Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him, meaning God, who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. Even the hairs of your head are numbered. God knows. He's saying, your God knows everything. And you are of more value than many sparrows. <laughs> Jesus is saying here, and, and the fear of God, if, if you're not familiar with that phrase, is not running away, being scared of God. It's, it's an awe, it's reverence of, of what God can do. It's the reason we come to God, to protect us from his wrath. He, he openly offers to protect us from his eternal wrath. And so Jesus is saying, God holds your eternity in his hand. God holds your eternity in his hand. God holds you in his hand. What we want to do, what he means by fearing God there, is to, is to come to him, come to him through Jesus, come to him in Jesus. So that in your eternity, you will eternally be in the hand of God and not cast away. Adam couldn't hide and Eve couldn't hide. We can't hide. We don't want to hide. What we want to do is stand at the foot of the cross, kneel at the foot of the cross, pleading for our lives at the feet of Jesus with absolute assurance that calling upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved for all eternity. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And from that comes repentance, from that comes acceptance of Christ as your Savior and your Lord. So we don't want to hide from God. In our sin, we want to run to God, to quickly restore our relationship with Him, to hold fast to the anchor as we sing, and as we also sing, knowing that He will hold us fast. God's Word is sharp, and that's good. God knows everything. We need to tell Him you can't hide, and you don't want to. This all makes sense for Christians. This is all good news for Christians. If you're not a Christian, this is terrible news. 
God's word is sharp and that's good. It's sharp and it's clear. It's not murky. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. There's no way to the Father but by him. And without him, you're bound for hell. God's word is sharp and clear on that point. God knows everything. We tell him as Christians because it restores our relationship with him. If you're not a Christian, it's not good news that God knows everything about you. Because one of the things he knows, the most important knows, is that you're a sinner not saved by grace. And as unbelievers, as non-Christians, you can't hide from God. And there's a day coming that if you don't accept Christ, you'll want to hide from him. But instead, you'll be forced to your knees proclaiming Jesus as Lord, proclaiming Jesus as Savior, but not your Savior. You'll never hide from the presence of God. Some people mistakenly say that hell is being eternally separated from God. That's not true. Hell is being eternally separated from the love of God. Hell is being eternally present in the wrath of God. But in that really bad news, there is still really good news. Because every promise that we made earlier talking about Christians can be true for every other person. That's the good news. Turn to Jesus. He will save you. As the author of Hebrews points out over and over again, today, today, today is the day of salvation. Turn to Jesus. You won't have to hide. You won't want to. You'll want to confess your sin and have your relationship with him restored. And so to those of us here that, that, that are Christians who understand that we're standing completely open, that God knows everything about us, every thought, every, every bad and sinful thought that we have, we confess those. We know we have assurance of our eternity. We have work to do. We're, we're assured of our eternity. We want others to be assured as well. Keep going back to verse 11. So that none may fall by the same sort of disobedience. When the spies went into Egypt and came back out, 10 of them said, they're too big for us, we can't handle them. Joshua and Caleb didn't just cave in. They tried to convince them otherwise. They did their best. They, they failed. But they did their best. And then they remained in leadership and they brought the next generation. It was Joshua and Caleb that brought them into the promised land. So as we look around us and we see people that, that don't know Jesus, we want them to be in heaven with us. We want them to enter God's rest alongside us. We want to gather with Christians from every age, gathered around the throne of God. And we look at people who are around us now that we're concerned won't be there. We must tell them the good news. If not us, who? If not today, when? I've heard an alarming statistic. I, I can't keep the generations straight, the, the X and Ys, the Z, I can't keep them straight, but of high school students today, that age group, 12% <laughs> attend church. Now, church doesn't save you. But being a Christian should bring you into a local church. 12%. So with the other side, the 88%. Go, go sit out in front of the, uh, of the high school, any of the high schools one day. Just sit there and just look at kids coming out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. More than likely don't know Christ. One, two, might. Next day, or nine, probably not. One or two that might. Not just high school kids, co-workers, neighbors. We have a job to do. Because part of our standing before a holy God, part of him knowing our thoughts and our intentions, he knows where we stand in our own personal evangelism. I'm very convicted myself by this. 
we need to tell people the very simple good news that Jesus saves. Go to a good restaurant, have a great meal, you tell everybody you know. The next meal might not even be great there. You might get lucky. Salvation is eternal. Jesus has saved you. Go and tell.